up, everybody? Welcome back to U.S. History Class. Okay, today I would add this material to your Cold War era notes. This definitely fits into that broad category and really doesn't have too much to do with uh, the civil rights movement at all. Uh, so I would put in a heading for this guy, Joe McCarthy. Uh, maybe some of you have heard his name before, maybe not. Uh, he's a guy that will still get referenced and brought up, even in like modern politics. Uh, McCarthy goes down is mm, kind of a seedy, almost maybe I should say villain in, in American history. Now, when I say villain, I, I don't want you to equate him in your head with like Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin. Um, he's not, in a, didn't have that kind of power and he uh, isn't as like evil as those guys, but he generally gets looked at today as, man, this was just kind of a rotten guy that was a scuzzy dude that did what he could. He, he ruined other people's reputations uh, to get more power and, and recognition and stuff for himself. All right. So Joe McCarthy should be a heading. And here we go. There's going to be uh, several pretty important things that I'm going to have you add into your notes on this slide. Now, I have a lot of talking points up here that it's just so I don't forget to include the whole story for you. You don't have to write down every single thing I have on the slides. Uh, the stuff that I have highlighted or in bold, hint, hint, that would be some key things that you'd want to have in your notes. And that's likely what I would include on an upcoming quiz or uh, some of this will also be on the, the semester two exam. So to give you some kind of a key facts rundown of who Joe McCarthy was, he was the junior Republican senator from Minnesota back in the 1950s. Um, when, and my second point is he, he was very unsuccessful at first and he's worried about his reelection. Now, when I say he's unsuccessful, I mean, he's in the U.S. Senate, so that's some success there. That, that, that's a pretty elite crew to be one of the you know, U.S. senators. Uh, but in terms of the whole Senate at that time in the 1950s, he was a pretty insignificant senator. Uh, time magazine goes through and I think every so often they'll rank the most influential senators down to the least influential. And I think he was like either the bottom or second to the bottom of the list uh, when they released that year after about his first year or two uh, being up there on Capitol Hill. Uh, he didn't get any legislation through. Nothing really notable happened. He's very much worried and probably rightfully concerned about getting reelected. You know, that's maybe a flaw in American politics that politicians care so much about just holding on to their power and getting reelected. They often neglect to do the right thing and what's best for the, the constituents that they represent or the uh, America as a whole. Uh, so anyway, he ends up realizing that he can accuse people of being communists, accuse them of being Reds. Remember, Reds is kind of a slang term for, for being a commie back in this time. And if he does that, that gets a lot of attention on him because, kind of like my last here, as he starts to accuse people of being like communist spies and infiltrators uh, that are trying to corrupt the American political system and, and our culture as a whole, uh, this is at the height of the Cold War. So it, it, the, the Cold War continually heats up and tensions get higher through the 1950s, and it probably peaks into the 1960s. So he is a senator kind of through the mid to late 1950s. Uh, this is the height of the Cold War. People are very paranoid about, about communism. Uh, we don't trust the Soviets. We know that they have nuclear weapons. People are constantly worried about like spies coming over and stealing our secrets and, and doing bad things to sabotage America. Now, in reality, you're probably there was some uh, valid concerns about espionage and spies because the Soviets were totally spying on us and trying to undermine our government and society. And we were doing the same thing to them. Right. Kind of common sense that modern governments, they, they use any means they can to uh, give themselves an advantage. So uh, he tries to make it seem, though, like communists are everywhere. And he definitely fans the flames of this paranoia. Uh, and it kind of peeks into like, you know, almost a mass hysteria where people are freaking out. Uh, when he starts to accuse people really pretty baselessly uh, of being communists. And a lot of these people were in high level positions. Now, Important term for you. This is not bold or underlined, uh, but HUAC, what I have on the top of this slide, which stands for the House on 
Un-American Activities Committee. Joe McCarthy was the head of this uh, congressional committee that had representatives, guys from the House of Representatives and senators on it, kind of a joint congressional committee. Um, He's going to be the chairman of HUAC. So I would definitely write down that HUAC acronym. Uh, I probably won't quiz you on what the term actually stands for. But what I would want you to know for HUAC is that it is a congressional committee that was essentially like kind of charged with finding un-American activities, a.k.a. communists, out there in society at large and, uh, and exposing that, okay? So kind of a tax force of congressmen that have a lot of power and that are going to subpoena people and call them to testify before Congress. Uh, you didn't want to get a, some, a subpoena from HUAC because that basically means they're, they're accusing you of being a communist or uh, working with the Russians or something like that. Uh, Anyway, McCarthy goes on and and he's the leader of this committee and he repeatedly goes out in front of the public and says, I have new information and I have a list of names, 18 names. And the next day he comes out, I've got 38 names and, you know, whatever the case may be. But he he constantly is referencing secret information he got and saying, I've got these names and we're looking into it and watch out. The communists are everywhere. So definitely like feeds into the paranoia and hysteria. And here is the thing. He didn't really have a whole lot of evidence from what I've ever been able to research from it. Um, a lot of these claims that he was making, these alleged like, you know, uh, claims about communist infiltration were pretty baseless. And, and he, I mean, for lack of a better way of saying it, he may have had some evidence here or there because there was communist like espionage going on. But I think the vast majority of the, the names he had in the list and the information were all pretty much made up and fabricated to make him seem more important and get the spotlight on him. Uh, now, very important term for you. Uh, this is still kind of applicable today in modern politics, uh, though not quite the same way. But people that get accused of being communists, essentially the, the slang term for what happens to them is they get blacklisted. So if you're blacklisted, it doesn't mean you're convicted of a crime or you actually are guilty of, of something or even being a communist. I mean, technically in America, even though we viewed the communists back in this era as the enemy, uh, you have the First Amendment rights and political freedom and freedom of speech. You can say you're a communist. Uh, It would be very unpopular, especially back at this time, Uh, but it wasn't illegal. Uh, But anyway, if you get blacklisted, that's essentially like you are accused of being a communist. And whether it's true or not, everybody now thinks you're a communist. And by being blacklisted, it means that like nobody's going to hire you for for a job. You kind of become a pariah, an outcast that nobody wants to deal with. Uh, So a lot of a lot of people in American society, while this was all playing out, got blacklisted uh, and it totally ruined their reputations and careers. Uh, Now, some of them may have been spies, but the vast majority of the people uh, that get targeted by Joe McCarthy and the HUAC committee really probably were not communists and they just get that baseless allegation on him. And then it, for a lot of them, it kind of ruins their lives. Uh, So, you know, he's doing a pretty rotten thing there and he knows that it's very damaging to have that accusation thrown against you. Uh, Today, I guess, I don't know exactly what I would compare it to, but, you know, it would almost be like saying somebody out there is like, working with terrorists and they're working with Al-Qaeda and trying to sabotage America, uh, it would be very unpopular. The public is sensitive about those kind of things. So uh, remember the communists or the Reds, that was like the perceived threat and enemy back of this era. Uh, Now there's a group he ends up targeting and like might think that the people that he is going after and accusing would just be his political opponents, but not really so much. He's actually, he does accuse government officials and people that work for the the military and the Department of Defense of being communists, and some of them do get blacklisted, but he also attacks and targets people just out in the culture at large. Uh, He goes after actors and directors and producers. So uh, there is a group called the Hollywood Tent, and now a lot of the most of the people that got subpoenaed and had to go testify before HUAC, uh, they actually go and they testify and they answer the questions that these congressmen are asking them. And a lot of the hearings were televised and people now have TVs in their home and they're watching these on the evening news. Uh, but there was a group of, of guys that kind of banded together that were friends and they get nicknamed the Hollywood 10. Uh, there's a photo of them right here on the 
where, uh, of the Capitol building before they were going in to uh, to answer their subpoena and go appear because you you have to by law if you get a congressional subpoena it's not an option whether you show up or not if you don't it's a, essentially like violating a court order and, and you'll get locked up for that. Um, so this group, Hollywood 10, it's a combination of actors, producers, and directors. These guys were friends. Uh, from what I know, I don't think any of them were actually communists, although some of them were probably very left-leaning, maybe had some some sympathies. But again, remember, even being a communist is not illegal. Uh, anyway, these guys say this is bullcrap. They, they get on the same page and talk to each other, and they make a pact with each other that, you know what? This is wrong. It, it is not appropriate for a congressman using the power of the federal government to come and attack us for any political beliefs that we have. So essentially, these guys basically, when they get when they go in and appear, they say, McCarthy asked them, are you a communist? Have you been to any communist meetings? Yada, 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 those style questions. And they say, it's none of your damn business. We're not answering your questions because we have First Amendment rights and we don't have to answer any questions about our personal political beliefs. So they make a very principled stand there. Uh, and what do they get for it? Well, most of these guys for refusing to answer the questions while they're like given the testimony, they get put in prison. So some of these guys are in prison for a few months. Others are in for years. Uh, they fight through the court system. Eventually, basically, these guys get exonerated. But a lot of them actually had their careers ruined. And it's it th- ran them through the mud and was an absolutely rotten thing. Uh, And now many more actors, producers, people in Hollywood and just in the culture at large went and answered questions. And you know what? Most of them just denied it because honestly, the vast majority of people that get called up weren't communist spies. Uh, They weren't working with the Russians. So most people just go in and answer the questions, even though they probably didn't think it was right that they had to. Uh, But this group of guys, I think I I admire them uh, somewhat just for making a principled stand because I do think they were right. It's none of Joe McCarthy or Congress's business, which way you vote or what political party you're in or, or who you support. Okay. Uh, Now, this guy, Edward R. Murrow, I would make a little note of him, too. He is a journalist. He's like an evening news anchorman. And remember, you go back to the 1950s, 1960s even, there isn't a hundred cable networks or a thousand cable networks. You don't have streaming or the Internet or YouTube. Uh, People now, most American families have a television in their house, uh, but you're limited to basically like three options. You probably have ABC, NBC, and CBS, three big networks. They all have evening news on at the same time. They all have some sitcoms and different, you know, shows like that. Well, you don't have a plethora, just an abundance of of stuff getting bombarded at you uh, like we do today. Uh, So most people watch the evening news at night and maybe we were better off for it that way because I think 24-hour news networks... (sighs) I I think that exacerbates a lot of the problems that we have in society today, that people don't get a break from the news. And it seems like horrible stuff's happening all the time. Well, back in this era, most Americans started getting their news from the the evening news on one of those three big networks. Uh, And they'd watch, tune in and watch a half hour to an hour of news a day. And that was basically it. Well, Edward R. Murrow is a well-known, he was a war correspondent during World War II. The American public knows him, trusts him. Uh, journalists weren't as controversial as they are today, where today they, you know, it's fake news and they get accused of being in one political corner or the other. Back then, I think most of these journalists were seen as they tried to be very fair and balanced and, you know what I mean, trustworthy and just report the news without giving their opinion on everything. Murrow definitely fits into that category. He was one of America's most respected newsmen. Um, After watching these hearings play out for a while, essentially, He's the guy that kind of has the courage to stand up to McCarthy and call him out on the evening news. And he's like, I sum it up for you. He's like, you know what? You say you have all these lists and all this information. BS, come prove it. Come on to my show. Show your evidence to the American public. Uh, McCarthy does go on Murrow's show. He actually accuses Murrow of being a communist, which the American public knows him so, so well from the warriors and everything. They're like, Come on, Edward R. Murrow, he's not a communist. He's as American as any of us. Um, Anyway, 
He calls McCarthy out. McCarthy does eventually appear on the evening news with him, and he does not look good. Edward R. Murrow comes off pretty rational and, you know, asking very valid questions. McCarthy comes off as kind of a, a Looney Tune ranter, uh, and uh, the American public in large starts to see through this whole scheme he's got going on that, oh, you're just making up these accusations yourself more attention and power. Okay. So Edward R. Murrow kind of uh, starts to unravel things for McCarthy. Now McCarthy's in. There's nothing on this slide that I'll quiz you on, but just to give you kind of a sum up of how this story ends, uh, I, this plays out for like a, basically a couple year period through the mid 1950s and late 50s. McCarthy does get reelected because his reelection comes up while this is all happening. Uh, however, early into his second term, people turn against them and they start to realize that, oh, this guy's kind of scheming and, and doing some kind of scandalous stuff here, right? Uh, the Senate eventually votes to censure him. Censure is a fancy way of saying all your colleagues took a vote and told you, you got to shut up. We're basically pulling him off of the committees. He's losing his power. Now, he was still in the Senate. He could still cast votes uh, on important bills and stuff, but he basically has the rug pulled out from under him, and he doesn't have any like authority or the weight of the federal government behind him. Now, he still, he continues to try to expose communist infiltration. Uh, but at that point, after he gets censured, nobody's really listening. People tune him out and they're like, this guy's a quack. Uh, now, McCarthy had always been an alcoholic. He was a heavy drinker uh, from early on into like young adulthood. Uh, when this, when things kind of unravel for him, he turns to alcohol and he starts drinking very heavily because understandably, his career is falling apart. People don't trust him and look at him as kind of a kook now. And and he starts to kind of self-medicate with alcohol. And I guess, you know, when this was all, the trials and the hearings were going on, he would drink quite a bit of beer every day. Uh, but it was beer, you know, kind of a, a lighter alcoholic drink, I guess. Uh, by the time his career goes off the rails, he's turned to hard whiskey. He's drinking liquor every day. And I've heard uh, that he was drinking about like mm, a fifth or so or a quart of whiskey a day, which is too much. That's really bad for you uh, if you're going to habitually drink that day after day. Uh, he eventually ends up drinking himself to death. He dies of, of cirrhosis of the liver. He, he drinks he, he, he drinks so much that his liver goes out on him. Uh, now, the last slide I hear, have for you, this is probably the most important one. So for those of you that paid attention and watched this through to the end, good for you. Here are two very important terms that I guarantee you I will cover again in this class. And I'm 100% they will be on the semester two exam. So I would want you to have a definition of both of these terms in your notes. Uh, so vocab term number one, McCarthyism named after Joe McCarthy himself. Uh, I still get hear this term get thrown around today in modern politics. Uh, if you ever hear somebody say, you're using McCarthy tactics, or that's McCarthyism, something like that, what they're saying with that term is, you're making accusations, generally of like being disloyal or being a traitor or something like that. You're making accusations of treason, something very serious without having evidence baseless allegations uh, are kind of like McCarthyism, okay? So a more concise way of saying it and a term that uh, it comes out of American history. The second term I have for you is demagogue. That's how you pronounce that, demagogue, kind of a crazy looking word there. Uh, this term I hear get thrown around today too. Um, I've heard over the last 10 years, Barack Obama and Donald Trump both repeatedly be called demagogues by their political opponents. Now, I, I'm not going to weigh in on that, whether I think either one of them is. Uh, you make that judgment on your own. But what is the definition of a demagogue is, um, basically, it's like a, demagoguery is like a strategy of gaining political power by appealing to the public's prejudices, emotions, and fears. So it's like back in this era, Everybody knew communism, the communists, the Soviets, that's the enemy, the Reds. We got to keep an eye on them. People are worried about a World War III. They're worried about nuclear exchanges. Um, 
People are sensitive about communism and communist infiltration. Joe McCarthy knew that. Everybody knew that. So he is preying on the public's fears and emotions and paranoia and worries, and he's making it worse. Uh, and he's trying to do. He's getting political power for himself by preying on those fears. Uh, another thing I get in there, just kind of an add-on for it, or a little asterisk underneath that. Uh, typically, if you're using demagogue-style tactics, it, it's done with rhetoric propaganda, like misinformation, salacious stuff where you're trying to capture the attention of everybody. Uh, so anyway, if you're a demagogue, you're somebody that's preying on the public spheres and emotions. Uh, today, I think there is a lot of demagoguery going on out there in society, uh, but it usually doesn't apply to communism. It, it ties into other things. Although that might be making a comeback and a change with China catching up to us and in that whole situation becoming very tense between America and China. And China, of course, is still one of the last remaining fully communist states in the world. Um, so maybe there'll be some some communist dig demagoguery coming back to us in the near future. We'll see. OK, I hope those notes made uh, sense to you. Make sure you add that stuff into your U.S. history Cold War era notes. And if you have any questions, by all means, Hit me up.